Order, order. The National Assembly is in session. Item one questions the First Minister. Question one, Alto Hussein. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and good afternoon, First Minister. What is the Welsh Government doing to improve the information technology infrastructure available to public services in Wales? Well, through the new public sector broadband aggregation contract with BT, we are creating a faster, more reliable, higher capacity and cost-effective network for public services in Wales. Thank you very much. Uh, First Minister, we have an IT infrastructure that's not fit for the 20th, let alone 21st century. We saw the tragic consequences earlier this month when it was revealed that a young woman from Swansea died of pancreatitis because her urgent referral was lost by the hospital's IT system. Will you now look to employ experts from the private sector who can deliver improvements to our IT infrastructure so that the cases like Zoe Wilcox can never happen again? Thank you. Well, uh, I know that uh, it is the case that some public authorities do employ uh, contractors from the private sector to uh, deliver ICT uh, services, uh, but the PSBA does uh, or should enable secure collaboration and information sharing across the uh, public uh, sector. There is no reason why that should not work in, in practice. Uh, and I know that NHS Wales has made significant progress in using existing and new technology so that a patient's information is available or should be available whenever and wherever treatment or care takes place. David Rees. First Minister, our, some of our IT systems are actually excellent and I've met with GPs recently and they've con highlighted that. But the problem is they're not necessarily always compatible with other parts of the IT systems in the health sector. And the need for the GP services to talk to the hospital services to also talk to the social care services so that we get a holistic approach to dealing with patients. What progress is being made in actually getting that compatibility and that mix so we can actually have a single system which delivers all for all sectors? Well, we have uh, invested £6.7 million in a new IT system that will allow health and social care practitioners to share information uh, instantly. It's called the Welsh Community Care Information System that will support information sharing, case management and workflow uh, between organisations. It's been the case, of course, that the Out of Hours Doctor Service has also had access to the records held by a patient's GP for a number of uh, years. Uh, and within the next few months, this vital information will be available for wherever patients receive care in the NHS, whether it's in the hospital, the GP surgery, or in an emergency setting. Peter Black. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, despite the rollout of super fast broadband, there are still a number of hotspots, um, particularly in urban areas in my region, and I think even in Cardiff Bay, there are some hotspots in terms of that. But I think the big issue is how we get, how we deal with working um, while, whilst on the move. Um, so. Having moved on from superfast broadband, is the Welsh Government to roll out 4G around Wales to enable um, businesses to access that, particularly where superfast broadband is not going to be available? Well, we are told by the uh, providers of uh, mobile broadband that they are uh, ever uh, improving uh, broadband provision in Wales, mobile broadband provision. They tend to talk in terms of 3G rather than 4G. Of course, the difference is that we have a contract in place to deliver um, land-based broadband which we can control uh, more difficult to do it of course with uh, with mobile broadband but we do expect the providers to uh, provide the people of wales with uh, a level of service uh, that they would expect uh, anywhere it's always been a source of wonder for me for example that one of the most, the most difficult areas to get reception on a mobile phone is anglesey which is mainly flat and uh, it's uh, not acceptable uh, that that should uh, continue to be the case in uh, in years to come we do expect providers to ensure that, that, that services are rolled out uh, across the whole of Wales in an acceptable manner. Question two, Christine Chapman. Thank you. Uh, what is the Welsh Government doing to improve educational outcomes in the Cannon Valley? Well, we have implemented a range of actions to improve educational standards in schools. They are set out in Qualified for Life, uh, which is our education improvement plan for three to 19 year olds in Wales. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, I know you will be attending the official opening of Aberdeer Community School tomorrow. 
Um, this outstanding school shows how the Welsh Government and Ron McCann and Taft Council working together are delivering for Cannon Valley, something the school's results from the summer further emphasises, and the number of free school meal pupils at the school gaining five GCSEs doubled, uh, despite the school having nearly double the Welsh average in receipt of free school meals. Um, obviously, inspirational leadership is one key way to improve performance, but how else can we make sure we drive up uh, outcomes for all pupils and free school meal, free school meal pupils in particular? Well, uh, I, I'm looking forward to coming to the school. I have paid a visit once before. It wasn't quite finished at that point, but it does show another example of a Labour Welsh Government working with a Labour local authority to deliver a new school, something that is unknown under the Tories in England, and one example amongst many in Wales of investing in education. In terms of how we drive up outcomes for all uh, pupils, well, our early years programme will start to develop earlier interventions to help to break the cycle of poor attainment, and we'll continue to explore every opportunity to support all children in Wales to reach their full potential. We have also strengthened the national school categorisation system in relation to free school meal performance, and we have set minimum standards for secondary schools to achieve within the next two years. Andrew R.T. Davis. Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, First Minister, the Welsh Baccalaureate uh, offers some students the opportunity when applying uh, for universities to gain valuable UCAS points. Uh, obviously, some English universities and quite, qu quite a few English universities don't look at the Welsh Baccalaureate as being valuable enough to gain those points. What role is the Welsh Government doing to undertake to promote uh, the Welsh Baccalaureate so that all students can use it uh, as a currency, if you like, in the points that they need to get to higher education? I appreciate the university's right to determine which qualifications they wish to use, but there is a role to promote it amongst higher education establishments in England. Well, well we are see seeing a declining number of universities that uh, won't accept the Baccalaureate. We have seen, for example, Cambridge, if I remember rightly, saying that they, uh, they will, uh, and Cambridge is one of the world's leading universities. Uh, we will continue, of course, to um, seek to educate the unenlightened institutions uh, in order to make sure that they understand that Welsh qualifications are the equivalent of, or indeed better than, qualifications that can be obtained elsewhere. I now call the party leaders to question the First Minister starting this week with the leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood. First Minister, how many children in Wales who have been or are being sexually abused have come to the attention of the statutory authorities? Uh, well, not enough is the answer, I suspect. Uh, whilst we have to look at the figures for each local authority, uh, there is no doubt that uh, there will be a number of cases that are not reported for any number of reasons. You will have heard of the news reports that I heard this morning, which talk about the, the difficulties of young children coming forward. Uh, the fear that they have that if they come forward they'll get the family into trouble uh, in some way and that's why of course it's important that um, social services uh, departments in local authorities continue to work uh, proactively with families in order to look to identify sexual abuse as quickly as possible. I'm not surprised you're not able to give me a, a figure first minister but even if you could the official figure is likely to be much uh, smaller than the actual number of children who were abused. And you were right to point out that the Children's Commissioner in England uh, today said that the number of children known to have been sexually abused is at the tip of the iceberg. Her study has been extensive and suggests that approximately just one out of every eight survivors or victims of sexual abuse come to the attention of statutory authorities. Do you agree that a similar study should be undertaken here in Wales? Well, it's a matter, of course, for the Children's Commissioner acting as uh, an independent person to determine whether uh, a study like that is needed in Wales, although uh, there is no reason to suspect that the situation is different in Wales. Uh, and so uh, it is for the Children's Commissioner to, uh, to determine uh, it may be, uh, let's wait to see what view the Children's Commissioner takes on that, but it's right to say um, that many, many cases, possibly even the majority, it's difficult to, to say, of course, uh, do go unreported. Some, of course, um, surface many years later, some never do. 
I welcome that you're open to such a study being conducted in Wales. The issue of childhood sexual abuse has been prominent in recent years due to allegations from uh, made against a number of high profile uh, individuals. And it's vital that both policymakers and legislators do all we can to make sure that we've got a system in place to support survivors of child sexual abuse, both as children and later on uh, as adults as well. Now, according to the Children's Commissioner for England, around two thirds of at-risk children uh, were abused sexually by a member of their own family or by someone known very close to their own family. First Minister, in the comprehensive spending review, we can expect further cuts to those areas that are not protected by the UK government. That'll mean more cuts to local government budgets and further pressures on social services departments, making it even more difficult to investigate child sexual abuse or to be proactive in investigating it. To what extent will the Welsh Government prioritise investment in services to protect and support those children who are victims or survivors of sexual abuse? Well, we have prioritised spending on social services uh, historically. We see that, of course, in the figures that were released by the UK Treasury uh, the week before uh, last. Uh, much of it depends, of course, on the settlement itself. You know, for example, much has been said that there will be an £8 billion pound uh, increase in health spending over a period of years but what from what we see this morning that money will come from public health and medical education which means potentially no consequential for Wales uh, and that is uh, a worrying because unless of course there is new money uh, added to the Department of Health budget then the consequential will, will not will not occur uh, or what might occur of course is that there will be a small consequential in the health budget that will be balanced by a negative consequential in the local government budget so until we know what the CSR actually says, and if it is the case uh, that, that money is simply being shifted from one part of health to another part of health, uh, then there will be no effective or no net uh, consequential as far as Wales is concerned. Now the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, figures last week showed that average weekly wages in Wales were falling. In fact, Wales was the only part of the UK to show a decrease. Now, the northwest of England, a region often compared to Wales, had an increase of 2% in wages, while the UK average increased by 1.8%. What do you put the for this failure down to? Well, if you look at the historic trend, we see that wages have increased. We see that GDP per head has increased in Wales over the past 15 years. We see uh, 38,000 jobs that have been created, safeguarded or assisted by the Welsh Government. That's better, even than 2013 to 14 best performance for 10 years. We also have recorded record levels of inward investment, which is helping to create high quality jobs. So yes, whilst the current figures uh, are disappointing, uh, nevertheless, the uh, trend remains encouraging. First Minister, the truth remains that Wales is the only part of the UK where the money that people take home after a hard week's work is actually falling. Com also, on top of that, Welsh unemployment figures saw, saw a rise over the last quarter, whilst UK average unemployment uh, fell. Uh, why do you think these situations are occurring? Well, as I say, if you look at the trend over a year rather than the quarter, you can see that the trend is very much downwards. But uh, one thing I will say is, is this. Uh, we know, for example, that there will be a hit of some £600 million on the incomes of people in Wales as a result of welfare reforms. Uh, we know that 384,000 children will be affected by the UK's current position on tax credits. It is inevitable if the plans on tax credits go through that, that many, many people will see their incomes hit even further. So the UK government has to do its bit as well to make sure that people are not hit in their pockets as they have been for the past four years and five years by the UK government. First Minister, I share your concerns about the proposals for uh, working tax credits. That's why my colleagues in the House of Lords proposed an amendment to stop those cuts dead rather than the Lords uh, of your party that actually just sent them back to be rethought. Now, pay and unemployment rates are stagnant, and perhaps then it's not surprising that the rate of empty shops in our high street is also increasing faster than anywhere else in the UK. Could you explain why vacancy rates of Welsh high street shops have taken a turn for the worse with a rise in the rate of empty shops for the first time in three years? The, the problems facing the retail sector are many. 
not just to do with the disposable incomes of potential customers. Uh, even if people have a rise in their incomes, it does not mean they'll spend money in the high street. Uh, they need to know that there are shops there that uh, are accessible to them, and for many, many high streets, they're only open between half past nine and half past five. So in effect, for most people, high streets are only open for one day a week because they can't access those, uh, uh, those shops for most of the, the week. There needs to be a, a rethink of opening hours to make uh, shops more accessible. Uh, we know, of course, um, the issues that are with business rates, which is why we have the small business rate relief scheme in place. For many shops, they have to consider online operations. They're simply not going to succeed if they are simply uh, businesses that uh, operate purely on the high street. Some can do that, some cannot. And there is, I think, a responsibility on landlords. I can say in my part of the world, landlords are not flexible enough. They keep on demanding 12-month tenancies for new businesses, in one case, 10-year tenancy for a startup business. For many, many shops, they will start as pop-up shops. They want three-month tenancies, not 12-month tenancies. So there is also a, a duty on landlords to be far more flexible in terms of the tenancies that they offer, and certainly has been the experience in my part of the world. And the of the opposition, Andrew R.T. Davis. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding <coughs> Officer. Uh, First Minister, yesterday there was a protest in your constituency uh, supported by George Jabour, a local campaigner who I think you're very familiar with, uh, that was highlighting the savage cuts that your government have made to further education uh, and the blind spot that you clearly have when it comes to further education. We saw that in the last budget round. We saw that in the last budget round. We saw that in the last budget round where you cut 5,000 apprenticeship places. The manifesto for further education colleges was launched today. Why is it that your government has such a blind spot when it comes to further education? I, I wonder and if he's you, told them. Will you, will you commit to stand shoulder to shoulder with George Abor in your constituency and fight for Bridgen College? Well, I'm not going to walk around with a placard saying I'm the Conservative candidate. No, that's uh, something I leave to him because no one knows who he is, but there we are. Uh, well, I wonder if he has said to those representing FE colleges that he feels that education cuts have not gone far enough. Yeah. Because his own figures, his own figures produced by him and his party show that he wants to cut education spending by 12%. 12%. He cannot stand there. There was a smile on his face, in fairness to him. He's got some self-awareness. He cannot stand there and, sit and criticise us in terms of education when his own party wants to cut spending by 12%. Go and explain that to FE students. You keep babbling on about a piece of your paper own figures. That was your own figures. Five years ago, yeah. First Minister. Well, five years. It is, it is a fact, First Minister, that you have let FE down. Yeah, me. But interestingly, interestingly, when you talk about commitments, we were committed in 2011 to protect the health budget. Now, I note from yeah. your press conference yesterday that you were saying that you were going to protect education oh. and protect health. Today, the Chancellor has announced 3.8 billion pounds worth of extra money yeah. for the English NHS in the next financial year. There will be, there will be a Barnet consequential for that uplift. Will you commit to ring fencing that money in the next budget round so that it is put into the Welsh NHS? Yeah. Right. Is he saying to us today that there will be a full consequential to Wales a as a result of the CSR? Yes, a right, we've all, he's on the record. He said it on the record because our understanding is entirely different. What was being trailed on the radio this morning is that there will be cuts in public health and medical education and that money will be transferred to the NHS budget. There is no consequential if that happens. So if he thinks there's a consequential in those circumstances, then I'm afraid his naivety uh, overtakes uh, his perception. Because what I suspect is going to happen is that there will be money put into the NHS budget, I think that's probably right, but it will be taken from elsewhere in the health budget. And that will mean that we will get almost no consequential at all. Now, he sits there and gives me a babbling. I didn't produce the figures. He produced the figures. His party produced the figures that showed that they wanted education cuts of 12 per cent, economy, uh, job create, uh, spending on job creation cut by 30 per cent, local government 20 per cent, 20 per cent. That's the equivalent of a 38 per cent increase in the council tax. That's what his party are advocating. And we know, we sat here. Month after month, month after month, listening to Darren Miller saying record-breaking cuts in the Welsh NHS. In fact, his party spends less per head, less per head in England than is the case in Wales. So far from there being record-breaking cuts in Wales, we spend more on our people, and the cuts that have occurred in England represent the all-time, all-comers record in slashing health budgets. We're not going to take those lessons from you.
You talked for literally three minutes there, First Minister, and the one thing you didn't say was an answer to the question I put to you. Right. When there is a consequential for the money announced, when there is a consequential, because that consequential will come down to Cardiff Bay, will you protect that money for the Welsh NHS? Yeah. It's a simple yes or no. It's quite yeah. straightforward. You spoke for three minutes. Can you give the people of Wales a straight yes or no? Are you going to protect that consequential for the Welsh NHS? The, the, ans the answer is yes, but I have to say to him, I don't think it's going to be a consequential. He's already changed his ground by saying a, a consequential or a full consequential. Now, we have heard it from the Welsh Conservative leader that there will be a net consequential, not here's some money for health and we're going to take money away from your local government, because what's, what's on the table at the moment? He has said there will be a net consequential. Okay? If we don't see that consequential tomorrow, it will show how weak he is within his own party. Yeah. Question three, Nick Ramsey. Will the First Minister set out the timescale for returning Cardiff Airport to the private sector? Well, we consider returning Cardiff Airport to the private sector when the conditions are right. Uh, First Minister, thank you for that answer. As you know, the outgoing chair of Cardiff Airport, Lord Roe Beddows, has said that the airport should be returned to the private sector within five years. You clearly uh, don't disagree with him. It's a sensible way to proceed. Do you agree with us that it would strengthen your economic policy immensely if you now provided a timescale for the sale of the airport so that taxpayers' money can be recovered and the Welsh Government can get on with concentrating on the public's priorities, such as protecting the NHS budget? Well, let me explain to him uh, why I think he's on weak ground. Why is he not, on, on any occasion, his leader's done this, in fairness, stood up and demanded the devolution of air passenger duty. Not once. If there's one tax that would help to invigorate the airport, to create jobs in the whole of the region of South East Wales, it is the devolution of air passenger duty. His party have been, well, his leaders mentioned it in committee, to be fair to him, but his party have been utterly silent. All right for Scotland, all right for Northern Ireland, Wales is second class. Doesn't deserve the devolution of air passenger duty. That is what his party in London have said. There are different views, I know, in Cardiff, but that's what his party in London has said. But, of course, you don't have any traction with them, do you? So it means, of course, that uh, we're not going to see that devolved, it seems. But let me explain one thing to him. What uh, Lord Roberto also said was he was surprised at the state of the airport when it was taken over and supported the action that we took as a government. That's exactly what he said. Now, in time, we will look to sell shares in the airport to private investors, what we will not do is give away a controlling interest, because that will take us right back to where we were before. He cannot pretend that the airport was doing well up to 2013. We tried to move to work with the, with the owners. They were not interested. They were not interested. We offered, them, uh, we offered them the opportunity to work with us. We offered them uh, uh, financial packages. They were not interested in working with us. And in the end, they said, we're not interested anymore. Uh, you can buy it from us. We took the opportunity to buy it at a market rate that was independently valued, and in time we will look to uh, recoup that money. What we will not do is put an artificial timetable on the sale of an airport that is now 10% up in terms of passenger figures compared to last year. That's what government can do for airports. If the Tories had had their way, the airport would now be, uh, probably be looking at being turned into a housing estate. Cantonive. First Minister, the uh, Tories have opposed uh, the action that was taken by the Welsh Government uh, in rescuing the airport uh, uh, every step of the moment, every year, day in, day out, uh, with vitriol. Uh, what would have been the consequence for Wales, for the area around there, and for the thousands of jobs dependent on that airport, had we not taken that action, had we listened to the Tory advice? It would have closed. There's no question about it. It would have closed. The owners were not interested in it, and they were talking openly to me about closing the airport. Uh, and that is something that we could not, um, could not support. And we see the airport as a future because we see the passenger numbers going up. I mean, it's quite odd what the Tories did. I mean, Mohammed Asghar, of course, supported it to begin with, uh, and then was sat on from, uh, from a great height uh, and was told to say, to just, just say that it was ironic, which is, well, he's been rewarded. We can see that anyway, uh, in terms of what happened last week. But no, no. Uh, why is it right then for the local authorities around Manchester to own Manchester Airport? or indeed own Stansted Airport? Why is it right for the Scottish Government to own Prestwick Airport, but it's somehow wrong for the Welsh Government to own uh, Cardiff Airport and to see it run by an independent company? Here we have an example where vitriol and ideology have overtaken common sense and the well-being of the people of Wales. Question four has been withdrawn. 
Question five, Mick Antonou. Uh, First Minister, what discussions has the First Minister had with the UK Government on the priorities for Wales in the Chancellor's autumn statement? Well, we have repeatedly pressed for Wales to receive a fair settlement at the spending review and for the UK Government to reconsider its plans to cut so deep and so fast. I know that the Finance Minister, together with her colleagues in Scotland and Northern Ireland, have pressed for a meeting face-to-face -face with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and have been refused at every turn. First Minister, as a consequence of the uh, Tory party policies in England, you have doctors on strike, you have doctors totally antagonistic towards uh, the, the government, you have an adult social care crisis in England, yeah. you have bed blocking uh, in, in England on an unprecedented scale, and you have the first stages of privatisation and moves towards the breakup yeah. of the NHS. Do you see any merit in actually following any of the Tory policies with regard to the NHS? And do you also agree with me that uh, social care and health go hand in hand, yeah. that you have to support both arms, otherwise you, they become self-defeating. Well, absolutely true, and the fact that it hasn't happened in England shows where people are now stuck in hospital where they, where they could be on the way home. Uh, that's the, uh, the way that these things have been approached in, in England. But um, uh, it might be worth me just, just emphasising uh, what I think Wales needs from uh, the CSR tomorrow. There's a funding flaw been talked about for uh, years. It won't be acceptable tomorrow to have the UK government simply saying, will there be a funding flaw? They've been saying that for years. We need to have a funding flaw which is fair and which settles the issue. Now, my, from the point of view of uh, where I stand, the Barnet formula itself has got to go, but in the absence of that happening and being announced tomorrow, then a funding flaw, of course, is important. We need to see a commitment to devolve air passenger duty, as the UK <coughs> Government's Commission on Devolution itself recommended. We need to see the money on the table for the city deal. It's the UK Government's proposal. Local government in Wales have come up with, uh, with commitments. We have come up with a financial commitment. We need to see the UK government coming up with his, its commitment. We also need to see progress on electrification of the South Wales main line. We now see it's being kicked back and back and back. The Prime Minister promised that the line would be electrified to Swansea. He needs to keep that promise, and we want to see movement on that tomorrow. We need to see progress on the tidal lagoon. Uh, nothing is being done on that. It wasn't even mentioned by Amber Rudd and we fear greatly for the future of the Tidal Lagoon in the absence of the UK government actually coming forward to support it. And that is jobs going down the pan in Wales because of the Tidal Lagoon not getting that support. We need those things for the people of Wales, and it's time for the UK government to listen. Janet Finch Saunders. Thank you. In their manifesto launched this week in Wales, the WLGA have called for fair and flexible funding for local authorities, including the transferal of £916 million attached to specific grants into the RSG and multi-year financial settlements to enable councils to plan more effectively. What considerations are you giving as the First Minister to those suggestions? Uh, we always look to see how we can dehypothecate some grants, and that's an ongoing process, but uh, I have to say that... Uh, I don't think you'll have many friends in England tomorrow after the CSR with local government facing cuts of maybe 40% in England. That is the end of local government in England. It can't possibly survive with that level of, of cuts. And uh, we will look to ensure that local government in Wales is shielded from the cuts that the party opposite would impose on them. A combination of astronomically high, eye-wateringly high council tax rises with a reduction in services. That just sums up the Tory party in one sentence. Jeff Cuthbert. Uh, dear Deputy Chloe, uh, on Sunday morning on a TV interview, the Chancellor refused to rule out cuts to frontline policing in particular. Do you agree with me that following the tragic events of recent weeks in Paris and, and beyond that have demonstrated the importance of multi-pronged approach to policing, both in terms of providing an immediate response on the ground, as well as building better relationships between multi-ethnic and multi-faith communities in the longer term. Do you agree with me that such work will be put at jeopardy if there are more austerity-led police cuts? Well, it seems, from what the Chancellor is saying, that he wants to beef up uh, security, and I wouldn't disagree with him on that, but use money from frontline policing to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent of saying we're going to spend more money on operations, but we're going to have fewer GPs in order to pay for it. It just doesn't add up. And so we need to make sure that frontline policing is properly financed by the UK government. I mean, if they refuse to devolve it to us, you know, so it's their responsibility. It is absolutely uh, the responsibility of the UK government to make sure that policing in Wales is properly funded. Unfortunately, the Chancellor and his comments yesterday suggest that frontline policing will be cut. Question, Ellen Question six, Ellen Jones. 
Will the First Minister make a statement on the National Library of Wales? The National Library of Wales is one of our iconic national institutions and has an important role to play in promoting our culture, heritage and language, of course. We ensure that we fund the National Library in the optimum manner, but there are financial restrictions on us now and for the future. First Minister, I agree with you that the National Library is an important resource for the nation as a place to store our history and culture in a safe place, but it's also important as a resource for the education of our young people. And we saw yesterday one of the National Library's pieces of art being exhibited and lent to a school in Torvine, and that was wonderful to see. And what plans and what budget does your government have in place, therefore, to extend the role that the National Library can play in concentrating on the education of our young people through digitization, as well as through sharing the treasures that they have within their resources? Well, to be fair to the library, they've done a very good job of that already. With di digitization, it's very important that the library goes out and does outreach out of the headquarters in Aberystwyth with the people of Wales. It's been difficult for the library because it's difficult for them to know what the, their budget will be for the ensuing year. We don't know what our budget will be because of the CSR that will be announced tomorrow, but we do very much welcome very much the work that the library has done in its outreach work. Uh, Joseph Brillowith. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, as I understand it, the National Library of Wales in some circumstances does work in partnership with councils the length and breadth of Wales to plan and develop new ways of delivering library services. Can you tell us how the Welsh Government encourages all local authorities to work with the National Library to develop innovative ways of providing local library services in the future? Well, as I understand it, they work very closely with the National Library anyway, and they draw on the resources of the National Library in order to assist th them in their own operations. So it's very important, of course, that we have a network of libraries in Wales. There has been financial pressure on local authorities. We all know that. But of course, it's extremely important that the local libraries work in partnership with the National Library in order to ensure that services are available for people locally. Question seven, Julie Morgan. Uh, thank you. Will the First Minister provide an update on the preparations for Syrian refugees arriving in Wales? Yes, the Minister for Communities and Tackling Poverty issued a written statement this morning regarding this issue. There are four local authorities participating in the Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme before Christmas. Um, I thank the First Minister for that response. Um, can the First Minister tell us how many Syrian refugees will be resettled in <coughs> Wales through the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme before Christmas and how many before um, the end of 2016? And are any of these likely to be... Um, vulnerable and accompanied um, children, as so many children have been orphaned or have been separated from their parents during the conflicts? Well, I, I can say that we will be welcoming approximately 50 Syrian refugees before uh, Christmas. Uh, at the moment, it's important to have the interests of refugees uppermost in uh, our minds, so uh, I'm not able to reveal exactly when and where they will be arriving. I know the member will, will know that that will, has the potential to create quite a media circus around that but 50 is the number. I can say that we have been hosting a conference today with partners across uh, Wales to discuss community cohesion issues uh, and, of course, to provide expert advice and information for partner organisations on the experiences of Syrian refugees. Mohamed Asker. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, last week the Welsh Refugees Council said there was a danger that Welsh government could provide a lot of resources and strategic oversight to the needs of people under the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme to the detriment of the needs of existing asylum seekers and refugees in Wales. Does the First Minister agree with the Welsh Refugee Council that we could end up with a two-tier system of support for refugees in Wales? No, I don't. Bethan Jenkins. 
Um, First Minister, I'm told that Swansea, a city of over 240,000 people, will be taking um, 60 Syrian refugees over the next five years, um, 12 a year. Um, that country now has 9 million refugees, 6.5 million are displaced within its borders, and 3 million um, in neighbouring Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan and Iraq, with 150,000 Syrians declaring asylum in the European Union, uh, where member states have pledged to resettle a further 33,000 Syrians, the vast majority, 85 per cent of which uh, will be pledged by Germany. Um, do you believe that Swansea in particular and Wales should be taking more refugees? No, I think it's for local authorities to work together and with ourselves uh, to uh, accept uh, the uh, a number of refugees that they believe that they can resettle. Uh, we have to bear in mind, of course, that nobody has any idea as to when uh, this human flow will, will stop. Uh, it's going to carry on while there is war uh, in Syria. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and at its root, uh, this needs a peace. This needs peace to be brought to Syria and a lasting peace settlement for Syria uh, as well. But I have to praise the local government in Wales for the way they've worked together and with ourselves. Uh, when I called uh, the original summit back in, uh, in September, uh, and uh, we have shown in Wales, I believe, that there is a welcome for people. I, I, I do pay tribute to those, for example, who were in Llangevny over the weekend. And I know it was a, a, a multi-party and no-party event that took on extremists of the far right and showed them that, in fact, there was no room for them in Llangevny. William Powell. First Minister, there is a huge potential for the National Parks of Wales and our other iconic landscapes to uh, play a major part in enriching our initial uh, reception programme for refugees coming to our country. Um, in my own area, the Hay, uh, Brecon and Talgarth Sanctuary for Refugees are hoping to organise some away days to the Brecon Beacons uh, in the early days uh, of the first wave of refugees coming uh, to Swansea. Um, do you join me, First Minister, in welcoming such initiatives so that rural areas can also play a valuable part in bringing to the table what they can? And what more can the Welsh Government do to enrich the sanctuary that we are providing to these unfortunate people? Well, we have been working with local authorities since the summit that took place in, uh, in September. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that people receive a welcome. I, I've been impressed by the, the work of individuals and volunteers in this regard. We saw the response to the original crisis. Uh, we know that there are people of goodwill, many people of goodwill who exist uh, in Wales, and the example you've given is, is uh, just such an example of that goodwill. We want to work with um, voluntary organizations, with individuals, and of course with um, public sector authorities to make sure that goodwill is maintained. Question eight, Mohammed Asker. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First, Mr. what is the West government doing to improve cancer survival rates in Wales, please? Well, we continue to make good progress in delivering the action set out in the Cancer Delivery Plan. For the first time, more than 70% of people diagnosed with cancer survive at least one year, and more than half can expect to survive for at least five years. Thank you for the reply, Minister. Lung cancer remains the biggest cancer killer in Wales. Although survival rates have improved, they still compare poorly with other major can cancers and seriously lag behind our European counterparts. The UK Lung Cancer Coalition recently highlighted what they call unacceptable variation in access to specialist nurses and surgery that exists in some part of Wales compared to others. What action is the Welsh Government taking to ensure that consistency in this, this service for lung cancer suffer, sufferers across Wales is maintained? It is one of the tasks of the Cancer Implementation Group. Uh, One million pounds has been allocated uh, to its priorities for this year. One of those priorities is tackling lung cancer mortality. Lindsay Whittle. Uh, the first minister, the highest mortality rates in Wales for cancer are in the region that I represent, South Wales East. What discussions has the Welsh Government been having with the local health boards in that region to find out how the survival rates can be improved? Uh, for example, the incidence of cancer is highest in Merthyr, but lowest in, in Cardigan. What research is being done to find out the re these reasons, please? Well, the, the, there will be different reasons. Uh, some will be lifestyle. Clearly, smoking, we know, has an enormous effect uh, in terms of um, the chances of um, uh, cancer being diagnosed. Um, some of it, of course, will be to do with uh, a, a willingness to come forward and see the doctor in the first place. That can be a, a, an issue for, for some. But what are we doing as, as government? We have the cancer delivery uh, plan that is primarily uh, doing, uh, working with uh, hospitals and carers to uh, improve uh, outcomes for cancer. But 
just to broaden what I said about the cancer implementation uh, group, their priorities are to improve delivery service planning and performance, to develop primary care oncology, to pilot a single urgent cancer pathway, and of course look at patient experience. We know that the vast majority of people, some 88 percent, 89 percent in fact, rate their experience of the NHS in difficult circumstances for them, of course. Uh, their rating is 89 percent excellent or very good. Uh, as we see more and more people living with cancer for longer, so we need to make sure that services continue to cater for, uh, for those people who are not yet in that position. Question 9, David Rees. Yeah, Welsh, what is the Welsh Government doing to attract doctors to come and work in the Welsh NHS? Well, we welcome doctors wishing to come to work, train and live in Wales. We attract doctors in a number of ways for GPs, the actions in the primary care workforce plan. And for junior doctors, our targeted campaign calling on them to make your future part of our future, emphasising, of course, that in Wales there is no junior doctor strike. Well, thank you for that first answer, First Minister. Now, as you rightly pointed out, there's chaos in England uh, resulting from the uh, lack of respect that the, coming from the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, to the junior doctors. Do you agree with me that the junior doctors in the English NHS should actually look to come to Wales, where not only will they receive the respect they deserve, but will also work in a Welsh National Health Service that continues to meet the vision of an Aaron Bevan and will always be safe in Labour's hands? Absolutely. GP numbers in Wales have increased by 10.5% since 2004. We know the number of hospital consultants working in the Welsh NHS increased by nearly a half between 2004 and 2014. And we are saying to junior doctors, come to Wales, where we will talk to you rather than threaten you. Karen Miller. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, First Minister, do you accept that the uncertainty which is holding sway around parts of Wales over the future of services and their configuration is leading to some of the recruitment challenges that we are facing, uh, particularly in places like North Wales, where we've seen the uncertainty over the shape of services in that health board be prolonged and going back as far as 2006? Well, we know that there are always challenges in recruiting in certain specialisms and in certain parts of Wales. That's been the case for some years, and that's why we have in place our recruitment campaign. Uh, but we do, in fact, well, not just anticipate, we know that there are junior doctors now who are looking at Wales as a favourable place to work for, not just for reasons of employment and, and pay, uh, but in terms of the opportunities that are afforded to them, and they want to get away from the chaos and underfunding of England. Alan Fred-Jones. Thank you very much. You're aware that there are great difficulties in recruiting GPs in rural areas. The decision by the government to scratch, scrap MPIG payments over a period of time is going to make it even more difficult to attract doctors to rural areas. In surgeries in the northwest, the loss will be £650,000 over a period of time, and this will have an impact on smaller surgeries and those on two sites, which is very common in rural practices. Why is this Labour government so determined to undermine GP services in rural areas? There was an agreement between the doctors and the government, so I don't understand why now that this is considered as an issue or a problem. It's not something that the government has demanded that the doctors do. This was an agreement between the government and the doctors. As regards recruitment into rural areas, we're still working with the health boards on that and considering alternative methods of working, for example, securing more... GPs that are paid salaries and not having to buy into a surgery, but this was an agreement. Uh, Joel Tepper, uh, First Minister, through uh, the Displaced People in Action charity, uh, the Welsh Government funds a programme called WARD, which enables, it retrains uh, asylum seekers and refugees who are medical professionals to enable them to practice here in the UK. I've been approached by some constituents who are not asylum seekers, but they were qualified to practice medicine overseas and are naturalised British citizens. And I wonder if you would consider, given the shortage of junior doctors, opening a number of places to people in that position so that they can help us with the shortage that we have? First of all, we don't control, of course, whether people can be registered to work as doctors. It's not devolved. Uh, we are keen uh, to utilise the skills of people, and the NHS has always done that. Um, the reality is that healthcare systems around the world are international in their staffing, and uh, Wales and the rest of the UK uh, are no exceptions to that, uh, to that trend. Uh, certainly, if the memo is just to write with, with particular details all these individuals, we'd be more than happy to see what, um, what we can do to help them. Qu question 10, Gwenda Thomas. 
CFF Prelewis, will the First Minister make a statement on efforts to promote international trade for Welsh companies? Well, the value of exports from Wales has more than doubled since devolution in 1999, and it's currently worth, or they are currently worth, an estimated £11 billion annually to the Welsh economy. And as a pro-business government, we are committed to supporting even more Welsh companies to trade overseas. Thank you, First Minister. India is an increasingly important trading partner for Wales. As Mr Raj Agarwal, the Indian Honorary Consul to Wales, has said, India is a key player in the global economy with a population of 1.2 billion and a large, catch, rich and expanding consumer class. The value of Welsh exports to India has grown exponentially over recent years. Figures for the second quarter of this year show a 175% increase from the same quarter of 2014. Clearly, Welsh enterprises, ably supported by the Welsh Government, are getting something very right here. First Minister, what lessons can be learned from the Government's support for Welsh trade to India that can be applied to other countries? Well, we, we seek uh, to work with UKTI, uh, and that relationship has improved, certainly in the, in the past uh, four years. We place offices uh, in countries in the world where we feel those offices can add value, and we've seen them adding value. We've seen uh, investment increase as a result of the offices in India and indeed other countries as well. India is not just a major investor in the Welsh economy, but it's a major potential market. Uh, when I was first in India, I've been there twice, I helped to launch uh, a product made in Swansea on the, uh, on the Indian uh, market. So it is a big consumer market as well. The difficulty, of course, is the uncertainty over the UK's membership of the EU. Uh, Indian investment comes to Wales on the basis that there is free access to a market of 500 million. The UK is not important as a, as a, as a market. As a place to do business it is, but not as a market. Uh, and that uncertainty is not helpful uh, in terms of attracting investment into Wales. And it's important, of course, uh, that this issue is addressed, um, uh, it, it, whether it's the end of next year or the beginning of, of 2017, in order that, that uncertainty can be removed. But there's no doubt that if we do not have unfettered access to the single market, the Welsh economy will suffer badly. Thank you, First Minister. Item two is the business statement.